tonight on Protect Exploitation. Is your marriage in a rut? Are you tired of busting your own nuts? Sex World, Sex World is the answer to all your sexual problems. A luxurious resort located in sunny California, outfitted with the world's leading sex experts that will accommodate your every sexual need and desire. At Sex World, Sex World. anything is possible and nothing is off the table. Unless the table is where you like it the most... Call now for your free questionnaire to start booking the vacation of your wildest dreams. Forget Fantasy Island and come to Sex World. Free shuttle bus from the airport. Where did the music come from? Did, did you do that? What's the difference? It's here. Hold me. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest and greatest episode of Project Exploitation. My name is Nick Cheney, and I will be your tour guide today. With me, of course, is Dan Jeremy Brooks, my fluffer. How you doing, Dan? Sex world, sex world, California, we're going to sex world. Do, 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 do. Cuckolds and incestuous fantasies, and we're all going to sex world. And my bus ride companions are fetishists and couples having problems in their first marriage. Do, 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 do. But I've got a reason to suppose we will all be without clothes at sex world. I think that's my favorite one you've done so far. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, honestly, it came together so fast. It was just like, oh, of course, Graceland, Paul Simon. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I've probably listened to the album Graceland like probably over a hundred times, I'm guessing. So. And I think we can all, uh, agree that Paul Simon was probably inspired not by African music, but by the dulcet tones of the sex world theme song, mm -hmm. uh, and just decided to make his own, you know, version of that. Oh, I agree. I agree. I think, I think that's. What is Graceland if not Sex World? Right. I mean, I think, no, I think that's basically the consensus now amongst, um, porn academics, yeah. you know, is, is that's, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, ah, uh, beautiful. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy we are here doing this, uh, for our very first triple X rated movie. So that's right, kiddos. If you're listening, turn up the volume because we're about to get dirty. Uh, no, we're going to keep it classy. Uh, probably. Probably not. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, kind of. We are talking sex world. Uh, before we get into it, I do want to ask my partner in crime here, Dan, is this the f first uh classic porn film you've seen like from start to finish um let me think about that i i would say probably so um i feel like i saw is it behind the green door or beyond yeah. i can never remember behind the yeah green door. i've seen probably most of that um well, you share that 
with one of the characters in Sex World. I know. That was what really tickled me, because I'm like, wow, of all the movies, this would be the one that I actually know. This is kind of works out perfect. Well, it is pretty much, besides Deep Throat, the other classic that people know, at least the name of. Well, and that was why I watched it, was it had such a reputation. Although, I have seen... Uh, and I don't know if this counts as, I guess it's not really golden age. Cause I think this is 1983 by then or 1981. Oh, that's golden age. Oh, okay. Well, so then I've seen corruption, which you, you lent me and I really liked that. Oh yes. I mean, that's golden age to me at least. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I forgot. I, I lent you corruption. Mm-hmm. I'm just corrupting you all over. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And I actually really liked what you wrote in, uh, you had written some stuff about it a couple of years ago and, uh, it actually did help kind of key in on certain things. I mean, just especially the use of uh, color, symbolism in color, you know? That's right. And if any of our listeners are looking for that essay, you can find that on our website, projectsploitation.com, under the essays banner, which is Mm -hmm. the only essay that's on the website. (laughs) Maybe, uh, maybe one day we'll add more. We'll see. Uh, I I should probably roll up my sleeves and do that sometime, but Eh. yes. Well, I mean, it's not just on you. Obviously I started the, the website and it's, join my echelon of uh failed blogs and i say fail that <laughs> not in any uh thing other than just me stopping full stop well it, it's not it's you know it's you gotta look at it like it's not a full stop it's just a pause true at, at the very least i co-opted the website for this project <laughs> exactly well and that was the thing is i loved the name of the website i was like why don't we just call the show that because i mean you've already got this great name let's do it yep. and it totally fits with the the theme so that it does mm-hmm Ah, so we are here to talk about Sex World, a 1978 uh, pornographic film. Just go over a few of the cast and crew credits, and then we'll get into a little summary. But uh, yeah, Sex World, directed by Anthony Spinelli. Now, Anthony Spinelli's real name, or at least his stage name that wasn't uh, his porn diploma, uh, is Sam Weston. Mm. And um, Sam Weston did a few things prior to uh, his uh, very uh, storied career in porn. The moment he said he saw a pornographic film in the theater, he just said, okay, that's what I'm going to do now, too. And he did. Um, But he's actually brothers with Jack Weston, the the actor who was in a lot of things uh, like Wait Until Dark. He's the one of the criminals. Um, oh, right. And that's, that's the thing I always think of because I love that movie, but he's in it actually a bunch of things. I mean, the Cincinnati Kid and a, a bunch of other random stuff. So. That's a great movie, too. Yeah, and I was going to say nominated for a Golden Globe, so that's quite the, uh, the family <laughs> of Hollywood talent. Most people described uh, Sam Weston, and that's funny, too, because whenever you watch or read the interviews with the Golden Age star, it's so funny because they're always calling them by their real name and not you know, the names that got stamped onto the movie. So at first, that's how you can easily learn, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, that's so that's Sam Weston, not Anthony Spinelli, for example. But um, all of them describe Sam as like a very serious person, not so much that he like, you know, couldn't have fun or whatever. But when he was on set, he treated this, you know, like a production that it is. And not to say that everybody else didn't but everybody else would be giggling at times and he'd just kind of be sitting there with his uh you know arms crossed like this is not what we're here for and whatnot. so <laughs> so it'd um, be like uh, most t- people- i'm sorry was, i'm just imagining tony clifton from uh the andy kaufman stuff where he's like an artiste is at work shut your goddamn <laughs> mouth you know sorry go on <laughs> yes mm. no i think that's exactly <laughs> what it was like and but the big thing is most people had nothing but great things to say uh, about him in fact this was cool uh, he's probably at least directly responsible for Kay Parker continuing her career in porn. Kay played uh, Millicent, oh. the uh, very, uh, shall we say, uptight wife of Ralph in this movie. And Kay Parker went on to have a legendary career in the business, but this was her first on-screen sex role. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. And apparently he, I don't know how she came across, but maybe it was someone, a mutual who knew about her or something. But when he was introduced, he very much wanted her for the part. But the way she describes it is that she was approached by him and he laid everything out and did not at all force her or not, you know, you know, or coerce. He just said, I think you would be good for this, but also I need you to think about it and not tell me right now if you want to do it, because this basically there's no going back. Hmm. And she was she was all on board, which is very funny because she's the self 
professed uh, prude of porn because despite the fact that she's one of the best in the biz, uh, like outside, like when the camera's off, she is not anything like what, you know, she plays. So, hmm. and apparently um, we'll get into this later, but a lot of the things that she said in her, uh, like some of the lines, you know, that she came up with were based on her actual personal uh, uh, <laughs> fantasies. And so it was slightly difficult for her to get through some of the scenes. So, Oh, wow. I'm that's fascinating. Yeah. So, huh. yeah, I know. I'm like, cause she said that like she, Sam always worked with the actors, which was kind of rare in that business, you know, instead of just directing, he would like have conversations with them about, uh, you know, how to tap into the character and what they're thinking and whatnot. And when it came to her, he basically just started asking her all these personal questions about herself, you know, Kay Parker herself. And she was very uncomfortable at first, not, um, you know, way that was put off but just in a way to be reluctant to actually share but then by the end of that conversation you know she was at ease and started oversharing and then she <laughs> found out and was completely okay with it but that some of that had made it into the script and you know and that's why i think it's little touches like that that obviously gives sex world a leg up on some of the other movies in its uh, genre Oh, that is really cool. I didn't realize that uh, he was uh, working on the script even up until right before. You know, that's really interesting, actually. I, I like that. The idea that he was uh, trying to tailor the roles more and more after he had cast it, you know? Yeah. And I think it also, too, is just that kind of attention to detail to a new person in the industry that I think makes him, a, a from what I can at least hear, a pretty stand-up guy and that he wasn't one of the uh, stereotypical lecherous uh, types. Sure. So, also rounding out the cast, um, especially of note would be John Leslie uh, as Roger the Racist, uh, Annette Haven as Dale, Sharon Thorpe as Lisa, Desiree West as Jill, and um, of course, uh, Johnny Keys as <laughs> Johnny Keys, or as Johnny Keys 2000. You know, it might not be Johnny Keys. <laughs> True. We'll, we'll get into what we think the sex spots are or are not for sure. But so, that may have been a huge stretch for him, though. I mean, you never know. He might have been like... Well, that is true. You know, it's like when Angelina had to play herself in the TV movie about her life, her disease. She's like, okay, and what would Angelian, who is me, do in this scene? How would Angelian, who is me, play? You know, anyway, I'm just goofing. No, no, no. <laughs> So one thing we're going to start doing here on Project Exploitation, we got a little uh, note from a listener about <clears throat> how sometimes because these movies are either hard to find or because nobody has time to watch them all, people want to listen to these episodes, but also have not seen the movie, which, you know, I say shame on you, mm -hmm. but I also completely understand. There's really, there's no, there's no excuse now. No, that's, no that's true. Mm -hmm. And they requested uh, summaries. And, you know, when you look for summaries on the Internet, particularly for these movies, uh, they're very bare bones and they barely kind of go into any depth at all to the point where it makes it pointless to even read them, which is why we are kind of ignoring them for the most part. <laughs> so we went in the opposite direction and we decided that we are going to start writing our own summaries of these movies uh, for the episode. Um Two things of note before I read the sex world summary that I have written for this episode, which is that, A, these are going to be ridiculously long, and we apologize now, uh, yeah. because there's just no other way. I mean, you know, we try to not talk about everything, but like I was saying to Dan before this episode, it, you know, for a movie like this, it's just an ensemble piece, and it's episodic, so you kind of can only write about it, and then this happened, and then this happened, you know, whatnot, mm -hmm. so. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but um, on the other hand, uh, you know, it'll kind of make it seem like you've seen the movie after I get done with this, so <laughs> let us know what you think, if you're a fan of this, or uh, if you think we could trim it down a little bit. Uh, we'll probably listen to you, but then not take your advice, so yes. without... <laughs> Further ado, this is the uh, excruciatingly long sex world synopsis that I wrote at like 1 a.m. last night. Woohoo! <coughs> On a busy California highway, a shuttle bus careens towards its luxurious destination. <laughs> Okay. This is really, first of all, right there. the quality is way higher than I, I, you're like 
using adjectives. I mean, I, I did okay. not, you know, no, I, I love That's it. why I want to pause right there and say, I did not keep that up for the rest of the summary. But oh, at, at first right. I was like thinking it'd be kind of funny if I like really treated this as like um, a, a really prestige novelization. Uh, but yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Honestly, anyway. I mean, it's funny because uh, right, dear listeners, uh, right before this, we were discussing novelizations and, and how they really run the gamut of quality. <laughs> but um, that is kind of a fun thing. I might try to shoot for something like that in the future. I don't know. We'll see if the spirit moves. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. I'm sorry. Go on. But it does I'm, sound great. I've opened it. No, no. But I've opened a can of worms now, so that's not good. I think I think it sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. At the front of a bus stands a man dressed in a gray uniform and outfitted with a calm demeanor as he speaks to a visibly excited group of tourists. The tour guide puts the passengers at ease with talk of how sex world is a world totally devoted to your kind of sex. He then begins to ask the various couples and singles how they heard about sex world. Always the good employee mining important marketing data for sex world's future potential growth. <laughs> this prompts a series of flashbacks that introduces us to some of the key players. The first flashback concerns the relationship of the married couple, Joan and Jerry. After being transfixed by his wife's latest painting, a nude of a stunning blonde spreading for the painter. The living room becomes ground zero for a quickie for the couple. Mm. Later on in their bedroom, a.k.a. the beef shack, <laughs> Jerry <laughs> finds an ad in the magazine circled and left out on the bed for him. Joan protests its importance lightly before Jerry agrees that it could be just what they need. Joan rewards Jerry with a blowy. <laughs> the next flashback centers around Millicent and Ralph a married couple who share none of Joan and Jerry's sexual compatibility, as Millicent shrieks at Ralph's impotence and mama fixation in bed. Later in their incredibly spacious living room, Ralph apologizes for losing his cool, and Millicent shouts about the lack of balls on Ralph. Ralph gets a bright idea, a trip to sex world. The tour guide gives a quick reminder in between flashbacks that there is to be no fraternization between the guests when they are on the premises, just as Jill makes eyes at Roger across the bus aisle. Roger rolls his eyes as he has more closed-minded views on the mixing of races. <laughs> the last flashback shows us the quiet life of Lisa, who sometimes goes by Cindy while donning a blonde wig during anonymous phone sex calls with a guy who puts an ad out for these kind of encounters. The scene climaxes with the guy on the phone expressing his desire to have sex with Cindy for real after they both finish. She subsequently freaks the fuck out. <laughs> Upon arriving to Sex World, the group sits in the foyer of a nondescript mansion that houses its own British host to class up the joint. He reiterates <laughs> that anything is possible as Sex World, not even blinking an eye at a question from the audience about the possibility of incest. When another asks if the people at Sex World are real or not, the host claims they are as real as you want them to be. The group then individually meets with an assigned counselor who interrogates each guest to get their ultimate fantasy out of them, as other White Coast scientists monitor these sessions in order to form the perfect fantasy for each guest. First up is Roger, who is assigned a rendezvous with someone he hates due to his display of hostility and aggression when trying to seem above it all during the interrogations. The woman who comes to his room looks an awful lot like Jill, the courageous black woman who teased him on the bus. Racism ensues, and so does sex. <laughs> we cut to Jerry, who is outlining a very specific, but non scenario to his counselor. He is treated to a scenario in which he is brought home by a woman, Joe, who is in a lesbian relationship with her partner, Linda, and they perform for Jerry, before finally bringing him in on the action. He cries out Joan's name during his climax. Mm. Joan is then shown with her counselor, as she is being shy about being forthright about what her ultimate fantasy is. She finally admits that her fantasy is one that involves a female friend of hers, a woman named Marion, whom she's been infatuated with for a while now. When Jerry arrives back at the hotel room, he is overwhelmed with his post-coital malaise, and he tells Joan he doesn't want her to go to her fantasy. She goes anyway. Joan arrives for her fantasy in a hotel room that is modeled exactly like her living room, and to her surprise, Marion shows up to ask Joan why she'd never been asked to model for her. They both disrobe for a sensuous tryst, with Joan finding herself on the receiving end of such oral delights, the painting never far out of mind. Mm. Ralph and Millicent meet with their respective counselors. Millicent remarks that her guy's gotta have balls, and Ralph worries about Millicent finding out that he needs to watch whatever Millicent's fantasy is, casually mentioning Mama once more. 
Millicent gets her wish in the form of Phil, who forces her to have sex with him as she tells of her first sexual experience, that of a lecherous boss who used to masturbate in front of her when she was younger. Ralph is whisked away from the torture of watching Millicent's passive compliance with her rough encounter. He finds himself in a bedroom with a calming woman who reminds Ralph that his mama is dead. Mm. They slow dance and begin to explore each other's bodies. Ralph gets an erection and excitedly makes love to his sex spot, Anne. Dale smokes a cigarette as she ends her meeting with her counselor. The lab rats concoct a Latin type for her. As she waits for her appointment, she places a framed photograph of a woman named Alex on her bedside drawer. A hazy flashback depicts Dale and Alex's sexual relationship, complete with Alex deciding she no longer wants to be with Dale after five years together. Dale is awakened from this memory, from Tomas knocking at her door. She requests Tomas to not shut the door, as she hates the sound of doors closing. Hmm. Dale takes things slow with Tomas, but eventually gives herself over to him completely. Lisa is seen with her counselor, as she talks about her lonely life consisting of a dead-end job and no friends. You want someone to be nice to you, the counselor zeroes in. She agrees enthusiastically, but takes it one step further and admits that she's a fan of adult films. This leads her to sharing that her favorite film is Behind the Green Door, particularly because of the famous scene featuring the legend Johnny Keys. The man seen earlier sitting next to the woman who inquired about incest is shown talking to his counselor. He details a very specific fantasy involving a woman who is like his sister, complete with details from his actual incestuous experiences involving his sibling. Before her appointment, Lisa is taken aback by another guest knocking on her door. He admits he's infatuated with her and knows it's against the rules, but wants to be let in to pursue these feelings further. Before she can accept or reject his sexual pleas, he slowly walks down the corridor out of view. The White Coats remark that this was Phase 1, and Phase 2 is now beginning. Who should appear but Johnny Keys in his costume from behind the green door? He delicately and compassionately gives her a night she'll never forget. The final morning finds all the tourists making their way to the shuttle bus as they try to deal with what they've learned about themselves and each other at Sex World. Joan confides in a counselor that she doesn't know if she has a marriage anymore. Ralph and Millicent rekindle the missing spark in their now recalibrated dynamic, and Roger pleads with a sexual employee to be allowed back into the resort for a repeat experience, all while Jill wanders to the bus in the background, looking on with a knowing smile at Roger's begging. Hmm. The sexual scientists all congratulate each other on another successful weekend under the warm glow of the Technicolor buttons lighting up the joviality until it is brought to a halt due to the sole human employee powering down the rest of her colleagues. Cue the Sex World theme song. <laughs> well, you know what? I loved that synopsis. I thought it was great. And it was actually uh, totally accurate, first of all. And two, honestly, it, it, it kind of reminded me of some things that I had forgotten about, which I'm glad because uh, I hadn't seen Sex World in a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate it. I, I thought it was great. And I love the, the, the use of the word technicolor with uh, the buttons. That's absolutely correct. Those are exactly what they are. <laughs> you know, they're just like, there's just that warm glow. You know, yeah. you feel like you could, those, those old 70s, 60s buttons where like you feel like if you pressed it, it would make a really satisfying chunk sound. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, you know, it's funny too, because reading that, you know, I'm kind of glad I wrote it all out like that because I also think it does counter the perception that there's no plot to pornos, which, mm -hmm. um, certainly is the case sometimes. Uh, I'm not going to pretend like they're all like this, but when one was firing on all cylinders, like I believe sex world to be, uh, there's actually a lot to mine from it. And while, you know, each, uh, individual you know character might not have the depth of you know whatever movie you're gonna compare it to or whatever um i always think it's the sum of its parts that i find the most interesting and particularly coupled with the depiction of sex and actually talking about it in a non-taboo uh, environment um it, it still offers something that no other genre can really offer so good point so yeah let's get into sex world um mm -hmm. i will start this off uh if that's okay sure and say i love this movie i this is the first porno i watched uh you know uh from this era uh well really from any era because it's really from the 70s and 80s in general um 
Uh, no, not to say that there isn't any in the 90s or even now. I mean, they still kind of make them now, but they're not the same thing. And mm -hmm. even the good ones, from what I hear, are like so independent that they're actually hard to like get or you got to like order them on Vimeo or something, whatever. <laughs> it's just not something I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, but this was the first one I had ever watched, particularly when I had discovered the company, uh, Vinegar Syndrome, who put out a wonderful Blu-ray of this. And honestly, it may just be serendipity, but this is also the first one I would make most anybody watch if they were like truly curious about the genre and, and what it has to offer and what, what it was really capable of. Um, I think Sam West and uh, Anthony Spinelli just does a crackerjack job at definitely balancing a lot of characters and and like i mentioned earlier it's not so much that i'm amazed by the depth but i am just in awe whenever i watch this about how well this movie flows that's one of the biggest problems uh pornos have when they're bad is that <laughs> they just have horrible sense of pacing you know either the sex scenes go on too long mm. or the plotting is almost pointless that you then kind of wish they were fucking it, you know and <laughs> in, in the yeah. worst of the genre it's just a, a it can be a slog to watch it says a lot that i've seen this movie now six or seven times uh, oh, wow. and i don't re-watch a lot of these you know like mm -hmm. They are what they are, and I very much enjoy them, but it takes a lot for me to rewatch them once, let alone, you know, uh, quite a few times. And I think mm. it's because Sex World is definitely balancing the idea that it doesn't have to be dramatic or funny in, in any particular sense of those words, because I, I hesitate to label this anything other than porn. It is so distinctly that as a genre because of the fact that it is so heavily focused on the topic of sex, not just the depiction of it. Um, and also it is not ever truly making light of these situations, uh, including some of the more taboo ones. Mm -hmm. And it is also not a melodrama, really. I mean, there's a few moments, obviously, where they're tying up loose ends and whatnot, but even those feel quite well earned. And I feel like this is the perfect example of uh, what can come out of this. So I guess I'll quickly go through and say some of the specific things I love is uh, I think this is one of the best casts ever assembled in mm. a porno. You know, it's 1978, so... Certainly, um, the stars of the 70s, for the most part, had been solidified. Um, you know, it's quite, uh, we're only a couple years away from the 80s, where, you know, the video vixens would start to, you know, overshadow a lot of these uh, stars. But oh, sure. other than Kay Parker, who's a legend um, and would go on to become one, uh, a lot of these uh, stars are fantastic. I mean, you have Annette Haven, um, you have... Obviously, Johnny Keys, but you have uh, Joey Silvera and John Leslie and all these people, I think, are kind of never better than they are in this movie. And it almost feels like the Avengers of porn. You know, it's like they're all <laughs> I mean, they're all always in each other's movies to begin with because, it's, you know, it's a small industry, so to speak. But this one felt like all of them kind of teaming up for the um they're all me the meeting of the minds both from talent off the screen and also on the screen sort of an like an all-star game if you will or something yes exactly and i think the the script absolutely serves them all because i think in my opinion uh the scenes are for the most part hot uh mm -hmm. and i think the actual characterization of everybody is pretty spot on i like the fact that we are treated to a mixture of different problems, uh, some that are easily solved and some that are not solved at all. And I kind of find that that was very daring, especially because pornos usually ran hot and cold uh, in one direction. You know, there were truly you had the very light fluff sex comedies and whatnot. And then you had the extremely like nihilistic, you know, like everyone's a horrible person and you know like oh, wow. the whole diary of a prostitute type porno trope of a plot it. where it's um you know like uh anthony spinelli made cry for cindy and that's about uh that was a pretty 
it's a good movie and it's also uh an entry in a trope that a lot of pornos do where it's like um a bunch of people show up to a dead prostitute's funeral and then reminisce on mm. the times that they had and that's the way that they kind of break up the episodic nature and also obviously uh am, am able to put in the sex and whatnot sure well it's a it's a reliable structure i have to say i mean it works really well yeah yeah, it was Cry for Cindy, her name with Lisa, you know, like this is, <laughs> that there, there's quite a few of them out there. And um, huh. and this doesn't really want to pick a lane as to being particularly uh, one or the other. And for that, I find it all the more kind of moving because we still don't have in Hollywood and in the mainstream cinema, we still don't have movies that truly uh, dive into the nature of sex and how we use it and abuse it and mm -hmm. connect with each other through it. And so I think I'll stop my rambling there for right now, but I'm, I'm just a big fan of this movie. I think it's ultimately a golden, golden example of both the golden age of erotica, but also just of this genre in general. And I really think more people should watch it it's um at the very least should try it obviously if you find that you can't you know uh for any reason that's understandable but sure. uh if you're not opposed to it because you're watching it already on a weekly basis <laughs> at your favorite website um <laughs> you could honestly stand to add some actual stories to it in my opinion so uh dan what did you think about sex world well, I, I really like what you have to say here. Um, and, and again, uh, I know very little about this. One thing that did strike me about the film was at the beginning when the docent on the bus was like, porn stars assemble. That was interesting. So I see what you mean about the Avengers element. You it know? was very much a precursor for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, uh, yeah, um, Joss Whedon saw that and he was like, now I've got it. That's the yeah, key. That's the yeah. key to the Avengers. The conch was a bit much, but uh, yeah, that was odd. Yeah, yeah, there was a little, little uh, Lord of the Flies in there too. But anyway, uh, I am indeed a stranger in a strange land. Um, which uh, I actually said that when we were recording episode three. You know, uh, bad girls go to hell because I had never seen a roughie before. But I think it's interesting that, uh, and I like this. The the first feature length horn film you saw was this one and this is very much one of the first for me so it actually I'm, I'm glad you chose this one to start with and i say stranger in a strange land which i realized later i was actually cribbing from the beginning of roger ebert's review of heathers so credit where it's due i should you know <laughs> he was the man you know yeah. you know because he was basically talking about like high school in the late 80s like i'm entering a world that i know nothing about it i'm like a pilgrim and and i mean it's a great review and, and he but he's very upfront about the fact that he's like i don't know if some of this is good or not um, but I can just, you know, tell you, well, anyway. well, and really quickly, Roger Ebert was very famously one of the, uh, marquee critics to actually take porn seriously during the seventies, you True. know, and he wrote reviews of them, uh, some he didn't like, of course, but some he very much did and had no problem, uh, professing that true true i mean you know at the beginning of episode three we've got him being interviewed with uh, doris wishman and he even points out he's like i've seen both of the chesty morgan films you know and it's like he, he yes. knows his he knows his stuff i was gonna say you know he was a he was a big old perv uh which i <laughs> say in, in a very loving and also uh knowing way <laughs> yes i hear you <laughs> uh well you know actually before we get into my thoughts uh I, I hate to stop the show just in its tracks here but i figure now's as good a time as any since we're talking about intros to mention <laughs> the intro that brandon kane performed for this episode uh that commercial written by nick of course uh very witty and just um wanted to say that brandon kane is the creator uh slash mastermind slash auteur behind the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour, which I've said a fair amount about because I'm also involved in that, in the uh, mostly in the mixing stage. But anyway, thank you so much to the great Brandon Kane. His uh, vocal work was just splendid. Yep. Well, I, I guess I should start by talking about my peculiar aversions, uh, which I know doesn't sound like the promising beginning to a dialogue. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to bring this up or not. <laughs> I, I feel like I should just because we're going to be watching more of these, and I, I just want to... Okay. So I should say now that I primarily prefer not to see the male phallus in its pre-epic or indeed even the tumescent stage in close-up, if at all possible. So that's, you know, and uh, speaking of an overshare, this is likely a big overshare, but 
I have, you know, I have a decent relationship with my own sex organ. Um, we've achieved a sort of detente, you know, we, you know, we, 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 you know, we, ha- we, we have come to an understanding, but yeah, you're attached. Well, exactly. Yeah, we are. We're attached to the hip. Hey, oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. But that's why if I watch porn at all, it's generally I'm watching girl, girl. Um, and the thing is women, I just think are just, they're all soft and graceful <laughs> and curvy and nice to look at and they make a lot of my favorite sounds so by comparison it's like naked men are just kind of disgusting to me i think it's like um i know you're a fan of um soderbergh but it's like it's like that scene in sexualized videotape where laura sangia como is describing it's such a brilliant scene she's describing the first time she saw a penis and how disappointed she was because she thought it was going to be like very smooth and sleek, like a test tube or something. And instead it was all veiny and wrinkly, et cetera. And I, I think that's kind of where I am in general with this stuff. So, so you wish penises looked better. Well, I, yeah, I, I wish that they approached the same level of gracefulness and beauty that I, mean, I just feel like women are just so wonderful. And so I think I probably made it abundantly clear by now what my favorite scenes are. <laughs> so, yeah. So I wanted to mention that. And uh actually, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up because, indeed, I feel I would be. I, well, I was worried and, and cons- this is a non sequitur, but I, I was worried and, and, and indeed troubled and even disquieted. Uh, by the possibility, uh, that, that the last episode, I, I didn't describe how deeply I admire the work of Elizabeth Shue and Palmetto. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got that and that she seems in that movie, she like walks in this sort of aura of a drugged out eroticism and suggestiveness. She's like a, she's like a fifties pinup emerging slowly <laughs> from a Florida heat mirage, you know? And so in aid of this, I had assembled 17 or so pages of brief remarks on the subject. But oh, okay, great. Well, I mean, I, 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 you know, but then I thought, you know, this might derail us a bit from the main topic, which is, of course, sex world. So I just decided to nix all that and just reiterate one more time how special I think Elizabeth Shue's performance is in Palmetto. So then that's it. No, no more. No more about that. Thank you so much for adding to the conversation. That is beautiful. You're welcome. <laughs> but seriously, folks, um, it's funny because I'm looking at my notes here and um, I have a, I always um, uh, have a heading above, like a title, you know, kind of gives a summary. And um, the heading for this section is in the beginning, there was me saying yeesh under my breath, <laughs> <laughs> but I chose to bravely fight on anyway with this one. So I, I have to admit, I was pretty crestfallen um, when I saw the credits had that faux futuristic lettering that I think in the seventies was meant to convey like, you know, crazy flipsville next level technology. And sometimes I think you'll hear the font called like mini computer or two bit font or something like this. Anyway. And I wasn't, I have to admit, I wasn't totally taken with the theme song, which I felt like a sort of Shirley Bassey sent up. How dare you? Well, I mean, it, it, the lyrics almost seemed inspired by Aleister Crowley. I mean, there's like sex world, do what you will. I'm like, do as thou willst. So above, sex world, you'll get your fill. Well, and it's a good rhyme. It is. But I, I it, it kind of unfortunately reminded me unpleasantly of those kind of mid to late 70s kind of like pseudo pop songs that were written specifically for opening credits. Like, I don't know, like jo- Joan Armitrading is the one I always think of. She performed this song, The Flight of the Wild Geese for the Wild Geese. Wild Geese is a great movie, by the way. But it's just, it just, it's, there's a lot of soft dissolves in the opening. It's just not... It's just not my bag. And and I don't mean to pile on, but I really wasn't hip to some of the Rhodes piano score. And I generally find that with flute and acoustic guitar. I just, I find that stuff generally pretty contemptible. And I think it just has to do with the fact of when I was born and that. But, but I am not here to bury, but to praise sex world. (laughs) Once I overcame my own prejudicial baggage, which admittedly it is, and I stopped focusing on, you know, the outer trappings. Uh, basically what I realized is that I wasn't meeting the movie where it was. And I should, I was trying to graft my personal aesthetics and, you know, my idea of what futurism should look like, which is just not, it's not a fair thing to do. And that occurred to me, why, why am I finding this? You know, anything that parodies Michael Crichton is almost by definition going to be pretty great. I mean, you know, see Weird Al Yankovic's Jurassic Park, et cetera, you know? So, and I say that as somebody who likes 
Crichton's Westworld quite a bit, by the way. So once I realized I needed to see the film where its head was at, not mine, you know, I started to notice some really strong craftsmanship that went into Sex World. And that's what I think first really won me over. And, you know, like I'm thinking particularly of the lighting and the attention they paid and appointing, like each each of the rooms at the resort, they're, the furnishings really do reflect the personality and uh, the narrative arc of the character inhabiting it. And I'm sure you, you've noticed this because you've seen it several times. You know what I mean? Like how, like with Roger, he's set up in this <laughs> really garish red, like kind of borderline offensive faux Afro Polynesian thing. You know, it's not, it's not actual Afro Polynesian. It's, it's faux. It's like what white people think yes. it would look like, you know? It's funny because he hates it immediately, even though he looks yeah. like at home in it because of how garish and obnoxious he is. I think in a way it's, it maybe it says something about him that he finds a little uncomfortable, yeah. but it perfectly fits his mindset at the beginning of the movie. And plus, it's also a set that really lends itself to the more comical dialogue that he and Jill have. And then, you know, but then you look at like Lisa's room has this very provincial wallpaper, very kind of there's, it, it reflects her kind of, um, extreme hesitancy and her delicacy regarding like not wanting to just jump into this thing, you know, it's very timid, very timid. Yeah. So it fits, it fits very well. This almost pseudo late Victorian thing. And then, then Jones world is, I think basically just an attempt to recreate her house. Like you were saying, but like a dimmer version with all these like soft pinks and greens, which I absolutely loved that. I think it's interesting if you compare her sex scene with Marion to her sex scene with um, Jerry, because mm -hmm. it, it's the same set, but like you said, it's dimmer, because honestly, the lighting does most of the heavy lifting, because mm -hmm. comparing the two, there's only romance in one of them, you know? Like, I'm not saying the opening sex scene between Jerry and Joan is not uh, necessarily good or anything like that, sure. but it's very much, uh, I think, only good for one party, and the other party is very much in denial about, like, how good you know, it could be because I don't think she was unhappy so much as unsatisfied. And, and those are two different things, you know, because she, I think, does uh, love her husband, but unfortunately realizes that maybe that's not enough for her. No, that's a very really good point. I mean, there is a difference between happy and satisfied. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, hopefully you can to have satisfaction. I assume you generally will be happy too, but maybe not the other way around. I don't know. But you're right. I mean, those I, when I watched it the second time, I was careful to really pay attention to the earlier scenes in their actual house because it was so much brighter lit. It's it's yeah. it's not amateurly lit. It's actually lit very well, but it's it's a much more even bright lighting scheme. While yeah, in the in the uh, sex world version, it's it's like it's like that, but heightened or well, or maybe dimmed is more the correct word, right? Yeah. And then like you look at like Millicent and um, No Name, I guess I didn't really uh, Millicent and what well, with her fantasy person or her husband? Yeah, no, her, her fantasy person. Her fantasy person's name is somebody I know is played by. Oh, it's Phil. They, they say it like once. Uh, right, well, yeah. I mean, the reason I could call him no name is because he's like, do you want to know my name? And she's like, not really. And, you know, yeah. so, which is perfect for that scene, you know? Yep. But like, they're like, they're like fucking like rabbits in what seems like, <laughs> like a late sixties variety show set <laughs> with like the white walls all around where you don't really know how far out it goes. And yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And then it, there's a, what looks to hell of a lot to me, like a Robert Motherwell inspired painting uh one of the major abstract expressionists uh and and then actually i'm yeah, i'm glad you mentioned this i believe let's see i wrote wrote it down you said you said uh jerry and jones bedroom uh that we see at the beginning like <laughs> before we get there and you know before we're getting jerry's it's basically jerry's flashback but you, i think you called it the uh beef shack yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's like, I'm, there's like this mural. Let's talk about that room. Well, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like this half in frame elliptical bowl or buffalo. And then the other wall has an ad in quotation marks yeah. for a can of chili. Yeah. Chili. Yes. And it's, it almost, it feels almost like they hired like James Rosenquist or Tom Wesselman, which are two pop artists I really liked or 
really more likely someone heavily inspired by those two guys, you know, to be like their personal interior decorator. And, and also the other thing is it kind of signifies something interesting, which is that they're doing pretty well for money if they've got this kind of personalized art in their room. It didn't look like wallpaper. I mean, it may have been wallpaper. It may not have been painted on, but it was it looked like it was made specifically for them. So you kind of get the feeling they're pretty well off, you know? Yeah. So it, it gives you a lot of information in one, in one little shot there. <laughs> oh yeah. And I think also the fact that just the picture esque way that those like art pieces are displayed uh, quite literally over their bed, you know, cause it's <laughs> like, they don't have any of that for the most part throughout the rest of the house. So the, fa- and usually the bedroom is where most people keep out, uh, you know, like the more decorative, curative stuff because mm-hmm. the bedroom is a place you I wouldn't say spend the least amount of time but obviously the place where you don't bring guests in so you're not mm-hmm. showing off for anybody and obviously it's the place where you do most of your unconscious uh, stuff so you know that kind of stuff the fact that it's absent from the rest of a house but it's very overbearing and present in the one place where I think they're having the most trouble uh, says a lot about their disconnect and really just the way that they've kind of quote unquote bought into uh, their sexual relationship. Right, right. Well, I mean, in, in that shot, I mean, the one I'm thinking of specifically, it's it's a, an establishing shot of them. And it's framed in such a way that they're really only occupying, I feel like, two thirds of the frame. And then the top third is very much framed in such a way so that you can see these things. So, I, yeah, yep. it, it gives you a lot to chew on there. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> Sorry. Plus, everyone just wants to think about chili when they're having sex. Right. I know. I mean, I mean, I'm a huge fan of chili, so I get it. I was going to say, I actually, I just realized that you always order the chili at one of the restaurants we go to. And now I'm just thinking when you watch this with uh, with your gal, Heidi, mm-hmm. like, did you when you saw the chili side, did you turn to her and say, babe, I know what we need? <laughs> You know, it's funny. I should have because she would have laughed so hard, especially because she's just moved into a new house, you know, like uh, in, uh, I guess it was December. I was going to say, now's the time. I know, right? And the walls are kind of bare. We're, we're slowly adding all of the artwork that we own from various locations and storage and, and putting them up. But I mean, it's true. I mean, it's certainly, this is the most likely time that it would happen if it would have <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I do want to say also, I was talking about the craftsmanship, and I, I think that extends to the way the script is paced. You know, like you were saying earlier, it's it, things don't go on too long or the dialogue isn't so bad that you're like, oh, my God, just get on with the fucking already. You know what I mean? It's There is a really well-paced three-act structure. And, and I, I understand what you meant about Spinelli being a very serious guy. It makes perfect sense to me now because... He, there's a, a rigor to the way it's set up. I mean, it's not like flat out perfectly in threes like some movies are, but I mean, right. it's not like Run Lola Run where it's like three, you know, very distinct acts, which I love, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, those scenes of them on the, the, you know, hour long bus ride at the beginning, that's a totally ingenious way to give us a lot of exposition and backstory for these characters. I mean, we've got, you know, these flashbacks to how at least a few of them heard about this i mean obviously we've got um jerry and, and joan and then millicent and oh boy what is her husband's name i mean we, ralph ralph thank you how could i forget and the two of them that's you know, we so we at least find the two main couples we find out how they decided to do this i mean in a way honestly it's it's kind of the grand hotel structure it's 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 basically the way chouser organized the Canterbury tales yeah which hey that's a pretty that's a pretty reliable structure there you know we're basically have this disparate group of people you know different classes and backgrounds uh, and they're basically taking a road trip you know like they are in the Canterbury tales too and then so as the journey progresses each character gets their own little tale and we kind of get that with really about well, I guess the two couples and then maybe three other people. And it's a very canny device. And it gives us a very clear idea of what the trouble is with a few of the characters, or at least the two couples, you know, before they've arrived. So by the time they get there, we've already got an idea of, of what the situations and the hangups are with the couples. So that's that's pretty damn good writing right there. Yeah. I mean, the way, like like you said, they show two couples and then the one single, uh, Lisa, as far as flashbacks on the bus. And I feel like the fact that they start off with them means we've uh, learned enough about 
some of the characters so that when we get to sex world, we can kind of hit the ground running and start peppering in even more characters because when we do cut to like Jerry and Joan, we don't need to spend more time on them. And so I, I, I do like the way it kind of folds in on itself so that it does enough heavy lifting in the beginning that it can then uh, cut up their pieces a little bit more so that it's uh, able to be chewed more easily uh, in (laughs) between the other uh, characters. But, you know, I also love, too, that the repeat uh, use of the counselor scenes, I think, too, is a great little yeah. structure because, I mean, you know, this is a porno. Those are not necessary, right? I mean, right. as far as the common perception of, of what this is all about. But they absolutely are for the service of this story and only of the story. And not only that, but it does pay lip service. I mean, if this movie has one flaw, it's the fact that, um, you know, it's got no real LGBTQ representation outside of, obviously, some girl-on-girl fantasy. But that is a heteronormative viewpoint. Absolutely. But at the very least, it still technically acknowledges a gay character at Sex World and one who is Mm. not conventionally attractive. And I'm not saying that against him Mm -hmm. uh, as a person. uh, But the fact of the matter is, because he wasn't going to be in a sex scene, I feel like the fact that he's not conventionally attractive, he's Mm. Asian, Mm -hmm. uh, he's slightly overweight, like, you know, like, and he wasn't a joke. You know what I mean? It's not like they cut to him and it was giggling about. Yeah, they didn't play him as like a figure of fun, like, oh, a little comic relief now. Yeah. And so I, at the very least, while I do think it's a slight flaw of the film uh, overall, as far as its representation, I love that little moment with that character. So I, I do think that it was, uh, it's, a, it's a great little recognition. Part of that wasn't necessarily, you know, Anthony Spinelli himself. That's kind of the way it went in the sense that, you know, you can't really sell, unfortunately, uh, gay porn to the, the masses that we're going to see. Now, mm. Does that mean that A, they shouldn't have tried, or B, that all gay porn was a non-go? No, because like Wakefield Pool made Boys in the Sand, and that was before Deep Throat, and honestly was a hit with the art house crowd. So mm. it, it is completely on the industry for essentially choosing to turn its back on the hegemony of all of this heteronormative porn. But having said that, there's still a lot of great stuff out there. It's just very segregated. Sure. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to uh, mention that you had told me um, in a conversation, I think we had a few weeks ago, you had mentioned that that was a serious failing uh, of the industry. And it's it's a sh- it's a shame, too, because it sounds like the, the porn industry was leaving money on the table, basically, by doing that. You know, everybody's money is green. Why not take the money from the LGBTQ community, too? You know, so it's, yeah. it does show a real hostility, I, I think, uh, a conscious or unconscious. Yeah towards that, which is really a shame. Well, and also, in a lot of ways, the porn industry had a major effect on mainstream cinema, because what the porn industry ended up depicting and showing ended up influencing what mainstream cinema was uh, interested in, you know, showing, mostly out of competition, because they're like, well, if they can go see that there, we at least need to show this, you know, here, which means that Not only was it uh, a bad choice just out of representation, but it also then is probably at least partly responsible for the the continuation and the perpetuation of mainstream cinema really struggling to catch up with uh, LGBT stories. Because if they're like, well, if it's not even good enough for mainstream porn, then, you know, we we don't we can drag our feet on it, too. And, And of course, it's not all on the porn industry's doormat. It says there's a lot of factors there. But they could have had a chance to actually really drive home the equality and no shame mm-hmm. in, in that sector and also in any of the kink sector. There, there's a lot there, obviously, to, to unpack. But Sex World, for the most part, while it has that very standard spectrum of tastes, uh, I still think it's a very compassionate film and it's more a sign of the time than an outright uh, disdain for anything that's not within those parameters. I think you're right. I think it is a very compassionate movie, actually, uh, which is not something sometimes we say about a film that's considered, you know, triple X or whatever. But I'm glad you mentioned the thing about the, the uh, I almost said interrogators. It's not quite the, but the interviewers, <laughs> uh, the white lab coat guys, you know, yeah. uh, because it is a fascinating way to get a thumbnail sketch of a lot of different characters 
in a way, it's it's very much like, um, and I say the word trope in the best sense, uh, but like basically in the last, I don't know, 40 or so years, mainstream cinema has, has used uh, psychiatrists or analysts or, or a therapist. And that's a great way to get a lot of exposition about a character. I think this is sort of like that, where you're able to learn a lot from just a, a minute or two or even less in some cases. I mean, some people are only on screen like, what, 15, 20 seconds, but you, you learn a lot about them. So, yeah, it's a great device. I would completely agree. And not only that, but the uh, the presence of uh, what I call the white coders is actually also a sly recognition of the way uh, porn gets made and sold to audiences um, because of the fact that one of the ways that porn really came into existence uh, as far as being an actual commodity you can sell quote unquote legally uh, in the early 70s was basically trojan horsing them into these faux documentaries or real documentaries at times you they would kind of import these uh, swedish documentaries uh, and then start to make our own here where they're like well this is a documentary about sex so technically speaking you know it's not obscene mm. and you know some of them made its way past i mean they were only obviously really viewed by the art house crowd in general but that was the first time in which the restrictions started to see real challenges. And they're called white coders for that reason, because they always featured uh, people standing in white coats. They were usually actors. Uh, but as long as you put the white coat and then they just talked about whatever you're about to watch and then cut to actual non-simulated sex, hmm. like that is in a, in a lot of ways the uh, the first real push at the door uh, before the floodgates opened. I'm just imagining these guys with like little pointers and they've got like maybe a chalkboard or something that kind of, is it like that? Sometimes. Yeah. No, sometimes <laughs> it's, sometimes it's not even that well, you know, set dress. Sometimes it is. And, you know, and, and they can do all that because certainly exploitation as we've talked about in the past, you know, has its roots in the scare films, you know, mm -hmm. and that, those were the original exploitation films. So oh, sure. that obviously is where porn also got to start is in the same type of moral panic or uh, nature observation, uh, you know, mm. uh, ways. So for sure. Yeah. That's so, interesting. And I think before we take a break, I will say that it's kind of, um, indicative of what I think this movie has up its sleeve beyond just the character relationship. But I actually think Sex World has a lot to say about the medium of porn and the way we consume it. So hmm. we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yes. And uh, I definitely want to talk to you quite a bit about Jerry and Joan and, uh, and, and Lisa. Oh God, do I feel for Lisa? I just, just such a heartbreaking hmm. story. Um, no, I mean, I literally, I mean, but also, yes, she's attractive too. <laughs> but anyway, why don't we take a little break and uh, we'll call this the refractory period. <laughs> and when we're back, We'll talk a little bit more about Sex World. I uh, made dirty calls uh, because I'm a creep. It was only a phone call, but it was a work of art. It's only a film. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this episode of Project Exploitation. We're talking Sex World. Before the break, I was kind of talking about how I think Sex World, the movie, is maybe a treatise on how people consume porn and how porn gets made. Before I get even further into that, I guess I want to open it up back a little bit and say... Uh, one thing about the genre as a whole and why I personally engage with it, besides some of the obvious delights, um, <laughs> yes. I think 
pornography, particularly the cinematic kind, is the most meta form of filmmaking. Mm. And what I mean by that, it is a genre in which participation and elicitation is essentially promised and guaranteed. You cannot passively watch porn. I mean, you you can physically passively, (laughs) uh, but even that uh, technically is probably tested at times. True. But when you watch it, you are quite literally uh, engaging with a push and pull that the actors and filmmakers are essentially putting on with this audience because everything about the genre is an attempt to circumvent the normal rules of engagement when it comes to filmmaking, as far as having a certain type of acting or having a certain budget and having a certain storytelling structure or whatever in, in order to service something that goes beyond the screen, Hmm. you know? And I feel like because of that, it is the most meta form of filmmaking and sometimes literally. So, I mean, there's been porn movies about the making of porn and, um, and those have been quite good, like skin flicks by Gerard Damiano, Hmm. um, or, you know, other stuff. But, I mean it in a more subtle way than just, quote unquote, breaking the fourth wall. I mean it in the way that when you watch pornography, you have to do some type of work, whether it's uh, the more pleasurable kind (laughs) or it's the outright suspension of disbelief when it comes to the divergence it takes from the classical mode of filmmaking. You cannot watch it and not... Uh, put yourself out there in some way or another. Mm. And usually it's the people who cannot do this that are just not fans of the genre. And I don't mean that as a pejorative as like, oh, they can't handle it. I just mean that it asks a lot of the viewer, which I feel like I'm probably already getting eyes rolled at me, <laughs> but <laughs> fuck it. I don't care. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's our podcast, not yours. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> but on that note, I, I think what I love about Sex World is that it knows this intrinsically and it embeds it into its story. The entire concept of these white coders, uh, you know, putting on these ultimate fantasy and, you know, with no uh, side effects or whatever, it is a lot about how we as viewers typically seek out porn, you know, as we we look for something that strikes our fancy and we are essentially putting our sexual lives in these hands, so to speak. <laughs> and we're looking for some kind of comforting that we are not giving ourselves or we can't solely give to ourselves mm. uh, or maybe can't get with our partner. And, you know, we, we, we turn to these stories for that reason. And I feel like Sex World, obviously, that's kind of the, the entire conceit of Sex World, both the resort uh, and the movie itself. Right. You know, the fact that, you know, there's a literal control room that is not completely unlike a film set. You know, I'm not saying that the visual language is completely there. It's certainly uh, its own thing. But let's be real, you know, clicking buttons, video monitors, all these things are signifiers of a visual medium in general. (laughs) So there's some cross section there. And I think, you know, that's the ultimate nod to to the fact that what sex world is to these couples, uh, pornography can be to to some people. It, It can be something that can help people. Uh, experience things from a distance because that's also technically what these, I guess, sex bots are because if they're not real or they're as real as you want them to be, if that's what you really need to hear, it's a way of, it's a distancing effect to explore these experiences and scenarios in a safe manner. And I think the ending, and we'll get into the characters again because I know we were talking about them earlier, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into them again. Oh, no, yeah. But just to finish this thought, the ending where the um the soul human uh <laughs> closes down mm-hmm. the shops and powers down all of her uh colleagues, which first of all I love that it's a woman mm-hmm. because I ultimately think that that's a great uh final message and that uh I feel like totally yeah uh, <laughs> and second of all, the fact that at the end of the day, while it acknowledges how fake everything was, you know because I mean that's essentially the the punchline, I wouldn't say like 
hilarious, like, ha ha ha. But yeah, it's a sort of, um, it's almost like a metaphysical punchline, you might say. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And the fact that, yes, this was even more constructed than you thought. It also is still acknowledging that there is nothing more human than sexuality. It is still filtered through a human perspective and has to be manufactured through a human being because there is no sex without a living being. So, yeah, so I guess those are my kind of tangled thoughts between the genre itself and I think how sex world itself manifests with these thoughts. Not only that, but the the scene with, um, with Lisa is probably the most overt nod to what I think sex world is doing on a scene by scene basis, but putting it in the forefront where mm-hmm. Lisa admits that she the she's a fan of pornographic films and you know what? There's you know nothing she would want more than to be in one. And of course I feel like every single person who sat in the raincoat crowd uh <laughs> would agree with that sentiment. You know, maybe not literally, but you know, you would fantasize about it. Sure. And for Johnny Keys to be the ultimate legend, which I actually think is interesting because Behind the Green Door is a great film. Obviously, though, there's, you know, there's a lot to dive into the fact that if Marilyn Chambers, you know, the, the main star, of course, of sure. Behind the Green Door, if she's whisked away into this very private club and, you know, she's uh, has to do a lot of stage shows in the course of that movie. If the ultimate quote unquote taboo, because it's what's behind the green door, is a black man in a very tribal <laughs> looking get up. If that's, well, I love that movie. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack there for better and for worse. Um, <laughs> so I almost feel like Sex World is a great way, I think, at least, that Johnny Keys was able to reclaim that image and essentially acknowledge that these taboos, these uh, offenses, so to speak, are pretty much inherent to the genre, hmm. but also there's power in, in what, for example, he did in Behind the Green Door, because that was a big thing back when that movie came out. Like, there's a reason why it was popular, because people saw a white woman and a black man having non-simulated sex on screen. And hmm. while it was certainly lean toward a certain way as far as how it was presented, there's still something evocative about taking the image of sex away from what I was saying earlier, that heteronormative, that, you know, white only type perspective and, and, and showing something else because essentially that's what sex actually is. It's this uh, non adherence to any particular thing because we all have uh Things you know, we're all attracted to certain things. We're all attracted to certain people, mm-hmm. but sex is so much more than the white men that are making it. So, <laughs> um, I give Johnny Keys a lot of credit for agreeing to do this, and I think honestly holding his own pretty well because I never thought it was like a joke. I thought the two actors took it incredibly seriously to the point where I think it's one of the most poignant scenes in the movie. Oh, absolutely! And oh, I, you know, first of all, I'm so glad you talked about the meta fictional aspect of pornography because i never really thought of it in those terms as being the most meta genre if you will but i, I now that you're talking about it i see what you mean i mean for one thing of course there's also i mean in this film there's the meta textual aspect about a guy who was in another film playing the same character just like three years earlier i mean it'd be almost like i'm trying to think of like a main it'd be like if uh you were watching I don't know. Uh, you're watching like a Chuck Norris action movie and suddenly Rambo appears and you're like, yeah. Oh, interesting. This is in this, you know, so I mean, it, it, or especially if they were from different studios or something, I don't know. Maybe that's a weird example, but anyway, uh, well, a couple other things. Um, there's also the fact that, um, <laughs> and this is just something I'm really just kind of thinking about now. Um, is, is that it is sort of the reverse of most films where, where most feature films are about people simulating right. sex. I mean, if there is a sex scene in a movie, it's people who are very skilled actors who have been trained in this very, quite literally, and they're simulating, uh, being, um, having an orgasm or something like that, or being touched in such a way that it, they respond. And yet with porn, it's the opposite where we're seeing unsimulated sex performed by people who are 
trying to play characters. So it's, it is an interesting kind of reversal. Yeah. Well, and of course, there's that tension there where you're like, well, we know they're actually having sex. So how much of this is the acting and how much of it is like, oh, that was nice. You know what I mean? So th- that's interesting. Which in real life is something we all do. Absolutely. <laughs> As far as when we're with somebody else, I mean, typically you don't really, when it's solo, I don't think people try to fool themselves <laughs> into thinking that, you know, they're coming when they're not or something. <laughs> right. In general, that's that's what a lot of our real relationships come to, that you can be in the most healthy relationship, but sometimes you navigate a particular sexual encounter to get the experience you want because of the mood you're in or because of the day you've had or sure. because, you know, whatever you're thinking of is not really working at that moment, you know, and obviously communication is key, but sometimes we just don't feel like it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, well, and, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the ending because speaking of distancing effect, like you were saying, you know, the sort of Brechtian alienation effect, I'm really glad you brought it up because I was like, well, if if we are to understand that the scientists, uh, except for one, apparently, at Sex World are basically all androids, you know, it leads me to wonder if the whole Sex World scenario is a large scale fantasy uh, that's being played out for another client elsewhere. Like, I don't know if they're using closed circuit or whatever, but, but, but the funny thing is in a way it is because we as so then are we the client? Exactly. We are the unseen client. And that's, that's the part that makes it metatextual, but not in a, um, pardon the term, but masturbatory way or in a, yeah. uh, like indulgent way. It's like, wow, this actually gets to the heart of so much of what we're maybe not think what we are unconsciously thinking about when we watch porn or something like that. Yeah. So that is a really interesting. I mean, that was, that was the one that it really only got me the second time where I was like, Oh, okay. I see. Cause, cause you know, like I said, my first thought was, Oh, well maybe this all is just a big room somewhere else. And there's a guy looking at it through a, you know, one way mirror or whatever. And, you know, or something like that. But then I thought, well, isn't that what we're doing? You know? Yeah. And, you know, not only that, but um, throughout the whole movie, we're constantly reminded that this is all completely fake and yet completely real, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, from the host saying that it's as real as you want it to be to the scene where Ralph um, and I think I forget her name and I think it's Anne or something um, before he solves his problem uh, and he still experiences his like you know neuroses and whatnot the music starts playing yes. and then all of a sudden Ralph says where is that music coming from <laughs> now up until that point music had what we had assumed to be yeah. non-diegetic uh, throughout the entire picture. We just assume we've been hearing scores, you know, overlaid over the movie like you normally would assume. And that track starts playing with no fanfare or anything. So we assume it's the same thing where it's, uh, you know, it's starting to be scored. Right. But now Ralph has broken that, you know, taboo and, and crosses over and says, wait, where's that music coming from? And even Anne, the sex spot says something like, don't think about it. It's, it, plain and that's all that matters and and so you know i love that the movie itself plays with that kind of temporal space between the viewers and and the action that's happening on screen and i think it's something that is quite often overlooked as a mode of viewing uh when it comes to viewing pornography but it's one that is absolutely present in all forms of it hmm. Yeah, no that's uh <laughs> that's an interesting point i mean that is an extremely brechtian thing to do uh where it's like wait what is this music you know what i mean and, and i had forgotten about that but that is a great little moment and it's it's not really dwelled on but it does strike me each time and then apparently i forget about it and then you brought it up now so i'm glad you did right because that's ralph does what the viewer does which is essentially says like well, that's not what i'm here for <laughs> you know like ignore that right uh because why i'm here is for what's about to come next so well and, and also i mean he's looking through the glass as a voyeur you know which i mean he's our sort of proxy at that moment as far as the characters in the film go so i mean so the, there's that other layer right there too you know yeah um so let's talk about the characters individually uh yes. we can kind of just throw them out there as far as whoever we want to talk about when we want to talk about i want to make a shout out to the story that we've talked about already of Roger and Jill. Um, certainly, 
that's probably the most overtly comical storyline because they don't really allow Roger uh, any real sympathy. Uh, True. So a lot of it's really on him because far as the jokes really on him uh, because the moment Jill enters the room, uh, she pretty much has him wrapped around uh, her finger mm-hmm. and then her thighs. Mm-hmm. Right. And yes. I will say that one of my favorite notions in this movie is that that is the only time we see two guests fraternizing because here's, let me say this. I think upon the first couple viewing, it's easy to think that Jill is just the sex bot version of Jill. Sure. But here's where I'm going into my theory zone Yes, to say, when you see everybody on the bus, you see everybody, including even like the, the gay Asian man who has his counselor scene later on. So we are treated to everybody on that bus at some point, uh, like everybody has a line at once, you know, even if they're not one of the stars or something. And Jill is the only person we do not see get an interview with a counselor, which to me says that that information is withheld from the audience because her interview was that she wants to fraternize with a guest, particularly Roger, and that that is her fantasy. Mm, And I think that's also what the knowing smile is when she sees Roger, (laughs) because she knows what his fantasy is. Otherwise, there's really no reason for Jill to like be like, haha, because she knows what he wants is to go see her again. And I think this is something she got off on, which is that she has no interest in ever seeing him again. You know, I'm not saying that it wasn't her kink or wasn't her fantasy. Sure. But she very much is was not like turned on by Roger as a person, um, at least as an uh, you know, his who he was inside or anything like that, but mostly just that this is what turned her on sexually. And I think there was power in essentially like getting them, luring them to their slightly awakening consciousness and then just saying, yeah, fuck you, you know, and like <laughs> whatnot. So, well, you know, it's funny you mentioned she didn't get an interview because it did occur to me at one point that I wondered, I'm like, Oh, I wonder if she's a plant. Like whenever they know they're going to have like a bigot on board, because they they do fill out a, a smaller questionnaire ahead of time. So you, you might be able to get a fair amount of a psych profile about somebody. Right. And they'll be like, OK, bring in Jill. So like so then it looks as if she's traveling with them. But in fact, she's a sex robot. But either way, it's, it is really intriguing. And I, I do love those scenes i mean they are the the funniest of course but but they're not overly broad i mean i guess the one thing that's a little broad is is her um talking and rhyme thing which i wasn't totally on board with i I think it might have been maybe a reference to muhammad ali now on the other hand maybe there was a great deal of that in the late 70s and i just wasn't there so i don't know but that said it it didn't really spoil anything for me but well it's interesting you're seeing roger (laughs) talking through these very racist assumptions almost like oh are you here to clean the room (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it's very Archie Bunker-esque if Archie had a raging heart on. Yes, exactly. Yes. And it's like you're seeing all of his stereotypes exploded like he's learning and course correcting almost, you know, in real time as it were, if you will. Because, I mean, he's like, oh, oh, you guys smell, you know, you smell okay, you know, whatever. One of my favorite moments in the movie is where she's (laughs) basically on top of him. And she's uh, pressing down on him so that he's giving her oral sex. And he's like, yes. wait a minute, I didn't say the world. And she's like, oh, we're going to do this. The literal <laughs> suppression of his ability to make those comments <laughs> is another reason why I believe this is actually her fantasy. I mean, sure. Um, I feel like it's his begrudgingly, because like they said, they, they needed to give him somebody that he hates. But I, I, I still think that the idea that this is a sub and a dom working in tandem. Oh, I could totally see that. I, I uh, absolutely love that. And and in, indeed, when I watched the second time with Heidi, I mean, we both laughed at, at those same spots. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm glad to know that these jokes are working for more than just me. <laughs> you know, your spigot ain't no bigot. Oh, my God. I know. I mean, okay, that was a, that's actually a really great rhyme. I have to say, I mean, that's a that's a right. that's a I mean, I got to credit where credit's due again. You know, that's right. So I would love to talk a bit about. What I feel in some ways is the most intriguing part of the film and, and maybe the centerpiece. And, and maybe that's just because they're introduced first, but 
Jerry and Joan. And, and first off, I want to say great casting. Um, I went on Wikipedia and I looked up Kent Hall, who plays Jerry, and he has some very uh, captivating eyes, almost rapturously captivating. And he's very a very watchable face. Yeah. And it, as near as I can tell, he didn't do at least enough to merit a Wikipedia entry, apparently. I mean, now, I, every time I rewatch it, I see, oh, the guy who plays Jerry. I'm like, because I, I can never remember who plays Jerry. And then when I watch it, I'm like, oh, right, because it wasn't really anybody who became famous. Right. And yet, you know, him and Joan, they have a very, very authentic feeling, kind of lived in rapport. I mean, even though, yeah. like you said, there's some, we learn later, there's some lack of satisfaction there. But even then, there's still. It's not really personal. No, no, not at all. They do seem to have a nice relaxed uh, rapport with each other, which I love. And that's not something that's easy to achieve in any kind of movie, let alone porn. And so he's grabbing the apple out of the kitchen, right? You know, for been fruit and all. I was going to say, I was wondering if you were going to point it out or if I was going to have to. Well, you know what? I think originally Heidi mentioned it to me. And, and I, I don't think I had thought of it until the second time when she mentioned it. I also um, like the way he rubs it off on his shirt, which I feel like yeah. is such a specific expectation that I see some people do and some people don't like you're, you're one of those or you're not. Yes. Yes. And I mean, definitely growing up, I think my family were the, did do that. But then later on it was like, well, why don't we just run it under the water? <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, it's like, it's that same sort of affectation where like you uh, pick up a beer out of a cooler and you set it down and then you just kind of like do this flick with your hand and you flick off the excess water. You don't need to, you know, but it's just some, some people do, some people don't. And it's yep. a beautiful little lived in detail about Jerry. Um, but I wondered if the fact that we're seeing him, you know, with the forbidden fruit, if you will, I wondered if the filmmakers were trying to suggest to us that Joan has intentionally left the magazine ad for Sex World out for him to find. Absolutely. You feel you feel that's there too? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wondered that. No, I mean, like, keep going. I'm saying I, I completely agree. I think the fact is that it, it is the forbidden fruit. And the idea is that he thinks that this is for him because he even says in voiceover, she always knows exactly what I need, you know? Yes. And, and that's his ultimate blind spot. It's he doesn't realize that there could be actual repercussions from something like this. Right. You know, I think Heidi also was the one that observed at the end that the couple that went in with what appeared to be the strongest bond and the healthiest love life came out in the most precarious position. And, and of course, vice versa, when you talk about uh, Millicent and Ralph. And I can't help but wonder if we're meant to understand that that has something to do with that really weird sex world rule, which is the one of the main rules or, you know, it's almost it's it's prime directive, if you will, is that you must not talk about your sexual encounter with anyone else, even your spouse. The first rule of sex world is you don't talk about sex world. Exactly. Second rule is no drinks over carpeting. Just kidding. Um, uh. No, but it's it, it just it seemed like the idea of not being able to talk to your spouse. It seemed perverse, uh, not perverted, perverse. So just to be clear, but it's it seems almost impossible to follow through. I, 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 it almost feels like the resort is like pushing a, a like this ready made wedge between uh, Jerry and Joan. And it's, I don't think it's out of malevolence, I think, but it just feels like the recipe for total, uh, total misunderstandings, all kinds of trouble. It's, it's mean, very Willy Wonka-esque. Very. Where it's like, essentially, I think Sex World, the corporation is actually trying to do couples a favor by saying, listen, you're, you're not equipped to discuss this. That's why you're coming here in the first place. So just don't do it. Okay. Just, just don't talk about it, which is not a great advice, but it's also, you know, trying to help by saying like, if you guys really want this, then uh, sometimes the only way to, you know, whatever. But obviously Ralph and Millicent never even mention it when they see each other and they reconnect. It's quite literally like, Hey, babe, we good. <laughs> no, it's true. I, I get the feeling that, well, okay. So the thing is, is that. Heidi felt what they meant was you can't talk about it at the resort, but afterwards you could speak about it. I got the feeling they were recommending you never speak of it, which to me seems almost impossible. If, if, if there's any kind of real intellectual intimacy between a couple, I can't imagine that not being part of the sharing. I but think I think I'm with Heidi in mm. that I think it's a directive for your stay at Sex World because if you try to have those conversations like how Jerry has his appointment first and then he's like not that they have a conversation about what happened but 
he then's like, yeah, I don't want you to go, you know, mm, whatever. Right. To have those kind of conversations while you're at Sex World defeats the point of being at Sex World. Well, yeah, and that's that's exactly what I was wondering is why is he so wary about her going? What is it that happened during his, you know, bespoke fantasy that makes him not want Joan to go? You know, and, and I don't know, this might be related, but something else we noticed is in the scene with Joan and her neighbor, Marion, or the, the robot of version, I should say, uh, we never see the climax, so to speak. Now, granted, in the, in the case of women, it's not as, um, graphically visual than it is for a man, usually when, during the climax. But I wonder, was there some kind of like ecstatic transformation? You know what I mean? Like in how she looks at the world that was, I don't know, made available to her at the height of her orgasm. Which, as I said, we don't see, of course, but or is it just that she's realized she's in love with her neighbor and this was like the proof of concept uh, that she was doing to make sure it was true and that now her marriage is in serious trouble because of that? I think it could be both of those things. I could also see it being essentially that this is uh, the start of a journey that has no end in sight, you know, like Mm -hmm. this isn't this isn't over. The fantasy does not collapse upon completion. This is something that is now. Uh, ongoing. So I think that's kind of why it probably trails off. That makes sense. Well, and of course, uh, Heidi, and she was being somewhat glib, but I mean, she's right. She said, you know, these two fantasies don't seem mutually exclusive. It's like, hey, you know, she wants Mary and the neighbor. He likes two women at once. I mean, right. I, to me, it seems like this is actually a relatively copacetic arrangement. I mean, maybe not something everybody wants to do every night, but I could see it compared to other people's. It doesn't seem untenable. What I think it also comes down to how you interpret, I think her fantasy is straightforward, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's pretty obvious what that says about not just her sexual desires, but also what she's lacking in general. But I think his fantasy is slightly ambiguous for two reasons. One, he uh, calls Joan's name at the height of climax, despite right. the fact that he's in a fantasy that has ostensibly nothing to do with her. <laughs> Obviously, it can come back to having to do with her. But when we saw him outlining it, like I had mentioned in the summary, it was super specific, but also extremely banal. Like mm. It was like, okay, so she's got to be wearing jeans, uh, but she's going to be wearing nothing underneath her nightgown. You know, like this, it's like something he's probably thought about a million times, but also has no deep psychological meaning. Right. And I ultimately <laughs> think that his reaction after his fantasy played out of him saying to uh, to Joan to not go is because he realized maybe how empty it was, which is that mm. he doesn't want anything. And this is my interpretation, not I don't think it's anything concrete, but he essentially is like, I don't want you to go do whatever it is you're going to do and find out one of two things, which is one, find out that there's more out there than just me, <laughs> or maybe the opposite or, or, or have this experience that makes things worse for us because because it's not as good as you think it is, like it was for me. I just feel like he thought there was a no-win scenario, sure. simply because I think he had a fun time, but also post-coital, like, that was it. Sex is what you make of it. It's not just something that is done to you. Sure. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's like, is that all there is? You know, I mean, it's in a way. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that, because, yes, there is a great deal of specificity to his request, but not a whole lot of thoughtful symbolism i think at least that he intended compared to like almost everybody else who's there yeah exactly (laughs) who is compensating for something right and i mean i think in a way that really ties into what i think one of the great ironies of the film is that jerry and jones trajectory is well the whole idea of this place is to create an ethical safe and consensual forum uh where you can recreate your fantasies in a sort of fruition free yeah. <laughs> uh consequence free environment so if you have for instance incestuous fantasies this is a way to safely legally do it and and perhaps even in some ways uh, morally or at least it's not immoral as much uh or maybe not at all i don't know but the thing is is in the what i think the movie shows and this is one of the things that makes it very rich is that it shows that in the end even the play actings do provoke very real emotional reactions regardless of whether you know they take place in a sterilized resort or out in the world, you know, I mean, these things can't, they don't exist as if they could be cleansed of meaning or something, you know, because meaning is assigned to it by us, even if we don't intend to, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, et cetera. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's 
to me, one of the most intriguing things is seeing how we keep trying to remove meaning and meaning comes roaring back. <laughs> it's called sex world, not sex room. Okay. It exists. everywhere. <sighs> Sorry. You're right. You're right. Good point. I do apologize. I will say they might need to rename their place and call it Sex Resort mm. because this wasn't quite the West World, uh, which I am joking because I know it was a porno and it was on a budget. But it's just funny that they're like, come on down to Sex World. It's basically a Motel 8 where we have a really good production designer. <laughs> I mean, well, it's funny because in Crichton's West World, I mean, there's even this funny thing near the beginning where they're like, you know, it's the West world and I think there's a medieval world and there's Roman world. And it's like Roman world where you can enjoy the relaxed moral atmosphere <laughs> or something. Yeah. So it's very much about let's have Bacchanalian orgies. It's not like, Oh, I've, I'm interested in the Roman. They don't even give you that pretense. It's like, no, nah, we know you're here for the orgies, you know, yeah. Yeah. but I, I think, I think the fact that we're, we're talking about that kind of irony of being in a safe place. And even then, we're not able to divorce our brains from it. I think that's one of the reasons why this film is such a cut above most pornos uh, of the time or any time for that matter, at least as far as I can tell, because there are real stakes. Uh, it's not just sex, you know, because <laughs> there's never just sex. You know, the characters have things to gain or lose. And I think that might be why, if you don't mind me talking, uh, moving on to this is... Uh, I think it's part of why I found Lisa's descriptions of her loneliness so rather affecting. You know, it's just that kind of isolation is so difficult to properly describe. And I know you and I understand this to an extent. And it's like, you can see her struggling. And she even tells the scientist, you know, he's like, well, I think I understand. She's like, no, no, you don't really understand. You know, he means well, but she's right because she's not able to verbalize it. And I think Lisa, in a way, is the most multidimensional character. She's not just a type. Like, you know, she puts on the blonde wig, which is super sexy, by the way. I absolutely loved that scene, you know, where she calls the guy from the personals. But I couldn't decide if her reaction afterwards is because he wants something deeper. He wants to see her in person, right? And she's frightened, or if it was just maybe good old fashioned guilty feelings of the Catholic blend, you know, right. <laughs> I really don't know. Yeah. But I mean, then there's the other part of her that she goes to X-rated movies, which again, seems to infer that she ought to, you know, be reprimanded for it in some way. Like she's mentioning it, like I'm doing this thing now, judge me. And like I said, you know, we know she is horribly, horribly lonely, all of which mm, shades her character, I think most out of anyone in sex world. I yeah. mean, the other characters are fascinating, but her art culminates in a, you know, that really, really strange scene, which you said was like phase one, yeah. right? Where this guy's trying to seduce down her door. And there's something really disquieting about that scene where the automated style in which he walks away from the door. Yeah. You know, that impasse. It's in such a contrast to the actual dialogue and the performance when he's at the door. Right. He's really emoting. And then as he's leaving, he's got this dead eyed quality, which actually reminded me very much of the original Westworld, uh, oddly enough. So yeah. kudos to them. And then I struggled a bit with the Johnny key stuff at first because the, the music cue is so, um, big it's it's very oversized <laughs> hmm. these words just seem so loaded right now i don't know why you know <laughs> but when he comes in the door it's like Durr, you know and and i at first i thought it was going to be kind of silly but then they keep cutting to these lingering images of lisa in slow-mo her responses so it's like you know fingers through her hair uh mouth thrust open uh neck spasming from one side you know of the yeah. bedspread, the velvet bedspread to the other. And it's all just so lovely and cathartic. And I think, again, because we feel, or at least I do, I feel such uh, sympathy for Lisa. It makes her catharsis all the more powerful, I guess. Yeah, I completely agree. And I am with you in that I think Lisa is, for me at least, and I think from what you're saying for you, like the best character in the movie. I think mm -hmm. yeah, she's the one who has the most difficult task as an actor. I think Sharon Thorpe did a great job in mm. bringing her to life. But I absolutely love the fact that her fantasy, she she almost feels like 
she gets the royal treatment at Sex World. You know, like mm -hmm. that the the white coders went extra hard for her because she's the only one we know of that got two phases. I mean, right. Ralph had that kind of prelude, but that felt more like okay, we'll give him what he wants until we can tear him away from that and actually give him what he needs, you know. Like, <laughs> right. Whereas here, I feel like she was quite literally given two fantasies, you know, for the price of one. Yes. Which is to feel wanted and to feel, you know, like someone being nice to her as she so desperately clung on to when the scientist mentioned it. But then to also not be dismissed when she said something as simple as wanting to be in that scene in that movie. Like, there's nothing diminishing about simply saying, like, this is my fantasy. It's It's to be in this scene to feel like that know princess on the silver screen right and so i love that they're like you know what let's give her both and i i you know i kind of feel like it's because lisa was the one who was dealing with the most and maybe needed it the most so i i find that whole sequence to be extremely touching it is it's very touching especially when the scientist is like you just want somebody to be nice to you and she's the way she delivers the line she's oh yes just someone to be nice yeah to you. and it's just heartbreaking and yeah. i i i just i thought it was so affecting yeah and also, I think, like you said, I mean, the scientists sort of give her the deluxe treatment. And I think you can even see it in the scientist who's uh, interviewing her. There is real sympathy. I mean, they're all, all the none of the scientists are detached. I mean, they're actually very uh, solicitous of the people. The only time they seem slightly whatever is when they're talking to Roger. And they kind of seem like, like, OK, we have one of these. And uh, what, what do you got up there? Right. Well, but Roger's like, been there, done that, nope, did that, not did that. Yep. And they're like, okay, we got a hard case here, yeah. you know? So, but yeah, I do see the way the, the scientists are sympathetic, but particularly the one towards Lisa. And, and I think you're probably right that they do sort of like, let's throw in the deluxe. This gal really needs it. <laughs> and I also do just want to say really fast again, how great those close-ups of her face during the phone sex scene. Yes. The lighting is so beautiful and her expressions are there's so many different subtle variations i think i sent you a screenshot from that scene way before we decided oh yeah because every once in a while you solicit a screenshot from me from whatever i'm watching and i happen to have been watching that and so i'm like oh god the lighting in this scene and so i sent you a, a shot of her uh on the bed underneath. I mean, it's almost circian in my opinion, you know, in that perfection of lighting. Yeah. I, I definitely got a little of a Nicholas Ray vibe too, although he was a bit more low rent, obviously than Douglas Sirk, but Yes, uh, dear audience, I do indeed, uh, often when I'm pretty sure Nick is watching a movie, which is a certain time a night. I was gonna say, you're always 50 50. I'm either sleeping or I'm still up watching a movie and that your version of you up is screenshot. Well, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I'll say screenshot, por favor, or screenshots, evil play, or screenshot, please, or perchance a screenshot, sir. And Heidi's like, you're just basically asking for a dick pic. And Pretty I'm much. like, you know what? Don't sully this beautiful thing we have. Right. Just because, you know, I'm not asking him, what are you wearing? That doesn't mean this isn't, this isn't a very wonderful thing. You have thing. asked me that at least once or twice. Yeah, you know, that was a sad attempt at humor, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but that whole close up of her, uh, and again, uh, I know we've talked about this before. Uh, I think we talked about it in the episode five, I think, the Vampires Lesbos, where we talked about Persona and how I think that's, you know, one of the most er erotic scenes in any film. And of course, it's just, uh, B.B. Anderson telling a story. And of course, it's, it's all in her voice and the play of emotions on her face. And I feel that same way that's true for, the Lisa character is that, I mean, yes, we are seeing him, but for the most part, we're sort of magnetized to her face. We're typically not, I mean, we see her sort of touching herself a bit, but for the most part, we're watching her, um, the, the play of emotions on her face. And that is the right call for the director to have made because it's really, really entrancing. Yeah. I, you know, in a very, uh, simplistic way, it's, uh, a very, very basic uh, look at, I think, the way we typically see these two genders perform in sex, right? It's, yes. it's the very men are from Mars, women are from Venus look at what each of the sex do during sexual, which is 
the man it's not just phallic but it's very graphic it's like oh they just want it over with you know because they just are very in it to uh skin it so to speak <laughs> and with the woman it's a lot more emotional and i'm not saying that i subscribe to this completely or anything like that or even that i think that it's um some kind of catch all but this is what's typically uh taught as the quote unquote standard operating procedures uh yeah and you know with with her character Absolutely. there has to be a lot more emotion in that uh mise en scene and, and mental workings happening because mm-hmm. frankly women are just a lot smarter than men but i digress i think you're probably right unfortunately i think there is a greater likelihood i'll say this i think there's often a greater likelihood when i meet a woman that she has an interior life of some kind like a life of the mind yeah. i think it's more likely that women tend to have a introspective side. I don't know why that is. And, and perhaps I'm being sexist in a, you know, in a probably because our society doesn't uh, always react kindly to when they express themselves. So, mm. yeah. So there's a lot that's sublimated, you know, there's a lot that just kind of goes thought, but unsaid, you know, you know what? I think we should start a new podcast where we talk about women and we describe and explain how women's mm. interior lives are, because I think no one knows it better than us two. I agree. I think we could call it like mansplantation or something like yeah. that. We'll have some good male guests on Naturally. to really dive deep into it. So. I think, yeah, we should get like, um, you know, Jordan Peterson. He really seems to understand women really, mm. really well. Definitely. And um, Definitely. I'm joking, audience. I can't stand that asshole. But I just because you can't see my face, you know, but anyway, there's, there's a line in the documentary now episode, the Ooh. co-op episode where I think it's Taron Killam's character. He says something like, if there's two things I know in this world, it's women and the future. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, that's great! And I always think I about love, that. Oh boy, I'm going to remember that quote. That's a good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess I would say the one other thing I want to say yeah. is that, and, and I'm mentioning this because of all the protestation I did at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> but I, I, although I'm not a big fan of it, I have to say that that double exposure showing the shot of Tomas penetrating uh, Dale overlaid with the image of the two of them on the bed, I thought that was very masterful. I have to say that was. Just about the best way I could see that being done. So kudos to them. I completely agree in that that the the way the superimposition really creates a tapestry on the screen mm-hmm. uh, in what's ultimately a fairly dull story. Maybe it's the weakest story of the entire. And I don't think it has anything to do with Annette Haven because she's actually my favorite actress in this mm-hmm. movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably my favorite of, of the genre, oh, wow. um, but. Um, she wasn't given a lot of like what you were talking about interiority because mm-hmm. it's a very straightforward uh, needs to get over her lover. And I kind of like the nod to bisexuality here mm-hmm. because if, if she was a lesbian, you would think that her ultimate fantasy would be meeting the next woman of her dream but here it's like no i need a a fling i need something and so they give her something that does do that and um yeah i i very much appreciated that and it wasn't really with any fanfare it's not like it was like no i wanted a woman (laughs) uh, you know or whatever i loved that too i loved that it wasn't like but you're bisexual it it wasn't like the very specific labels it was just sort of done and there was no big deal about it and actually in the same way that and i guess we haven't really talked about this i'll just say it really fast but the body types were totally different in the film all over the place. Yeah. Like Lisa doesn't look like Joan and Joan doesn't look like, you know, Dale and Dale doesn't look like Jill who, you know, boys who love girls who love girls, who love, you know, et cetera, love boys, et cetera, you know, blur lyric. Yeah. But it's true. It's kind of uh, shocking. Well, it's refreshing, but it's also shocking considering the the clips of porn that I have seen from this era. Uh, you know what I mean? It's it's a pretty stark uh, difference. I, I would agree. I think it's a really wonderfully assembled cast. And honestly, that's uh, before we get into final rating. That's the last thing I'll say about porn in general is that from this era, that was one of the things that always makes me return to it. Is that uh, porn, while it's not without its flaws, uh, was one of the most sexually liberated forms of storytelling even though i was praising the fact that it was very open about bisexuality that's not something that sex world did specifically that was something that was inherent to the medium mostly because it had to be like you know (laughs) we we can't 
have all this types of variation, uh, although there wasn't always enough variation, but can have these differing scenarios if we're going to have to get hung up every time, uh, you know. And so sometimes they did tell some good stories about bisexuality, like um, this great movie called Both Ways, where a couple is in a rut and both the man and the woman in that relationship decide to go look for uh, comfort in uh, other arms and they both kind of find something out about themselves and each other in the process. Mm -hmm. But in general, these things were always a given. And when things like that are accepted at face value in, in a medium like film, it does so much for people that are, that happen to be watching it. And so it's always a pity that, while a lot of people will be the first to call out porn for being exploitative, it's a two-way street. It was also usually one of the most progressive things out there because of things like this. And um, I, I agree with you about the fact that um, it's almost a default or an assumption that all women are sort of bisexual. I realize that's a cultural construct to an extent, but like you said, people watch this. I think art does have a liberating effect on people. I think um, art models freedom. Um, there's a German philosopher, uh, Schilling, I want to say, said it. I, don't be too impressed. I read it in a quote from something else. You know, I didn't read <laughs> <laughs> This is a second hand. But he said, art models freedom. And I really do think that's one of the most powerful things about art in any form, music, film, theater, uh, visual arts. What it does is it helps normalize things that people are afraid they're the only one who feels. There's this feeling of isolation, you know, like the Lisa character, for instance. I mean, probably a lot of her fantasies are very typical. They probably hear this stuff all the time at Sex World. But for her, because she's so isolated, she feels as if, well, no one in the world must feel like I do. I must be the worst person, you know? And I think art is a way to make that first step where somebody, I mean, there's no substitute for people actually interfacing with each other personally, you know, cause I think actual community is, is essential to human life, but maybe a film about this might get somebody to might make them bold enough to take a chance and talk to somebody about it, as opposed to just keeping it all to themselves and thinking they're just some aberrant deviant or something like that. Oh yeah. So, and, and then of course the other thing, this just proved my point is that the, the reason why uh, there's this tendency to view all women as, slightly bisexual in some way is because again, they're really good looking. They're curvy. Yeah. And I'm just saying, it's like, I see. I don't it. think we need any white coders to put together your sex world fantasy. It sounds pretty, pretty there, right there on the yeah, surface. It's, it is. Just it's put a yes. bunch of women in the room. I, again, as I said, I mean, that is the stuff I, <laughs> if I watch it all, which isn't much, but if I do, yeah. I typically am like, man, get the man out of there. I don't want to see that guy. I don't want him, <laughs> I don't want him within 10 yards of this place. Get thee behind me, Satan. Exactly. I will say, uh, one more note about Lisa that I actually think that's, you're commenting on something that's also what makes that whole storyline very touching which is that her fantasy doesn't attempt to quote unquote cure her it doesn't try to push her to be more outgoing or something like that right. it essentially is straightforward like okay you have been dreaming about this and you want this we're gonna give you that you know and it doesn't uh, attempt to try to supplicate her own journey and because she's going to have to do that work on her own, unfortunately. Of course. But while she's here, she's absolutely deserving of everything that she so desperately wants and can't quite get in her real life. So, and I always think that that kind of uh, compassion is always commendable. Absolutely. So, why don't we move into final ratings? Uh, Dan, would you mind going first? What did you think about Sex World? Uh, no, I wouldn't mind at all. Um, well, as I said before, anything that satirizes Michael Crichton's stuff uh, has got some of my vote. Not to say I, like, I don't like the Westworld film. I think it actually holds up pretty well. But it's got my vote for that right away. And then, of course, uh, fun fact, the dolly grip for this film in the credits is named Ed Sleesman. Wow. Hey, oh, Sleesman. I mean, you're born with that name. It's like, I know there's only one thing I can do with my life. I got to be a dolly grip on porn. Yeah. You know? Or maybe it could also be a fake name, but, you know. Don't ruin this for me, Nick. God damn it. Please. Mr. Sleesman was my father. <laughs> Yes, please call me Eddie Sleesman. Uh, so I will give it, I think I'm, I'm going to give it, uh, four stars. Um, and again, I think as I watch more porn, I may 
raise it higher because I'll get a better uh, understanding of the context and uh, kind of get a baseline for, you know, what's the highest quality versus the lowest. Because yeah. my theory is, and this is true of genres of music, is the best of any particular kind of thing, you know, the best of a genre, you know, uh, country or hip hop or whatever, the best of that is probably, well, not only is it worth my listen, but it's probably some of the best ever. You know what I mean? It's not just, well, you're in this section, but, you know, compared to everything else, you get blown out of the water. Yeah. And so I, I assume a movie like Sex World is, like you said, well, I don't know if you said it quite like this, but you said in some ways, I think I suspect it's sort of a gold standard for the time period. And I, I think it was, I've read that it was very popular. So maybe that was reflected in that too. Definitely. I am so happy to hear that you enjoyed it. I, oh uh, boy, I, give this movie five out of five stars, which is probably good for you. Yeah. You know, I genuinely think this is pretty much as good as it gets with this genre. And I don't mean that as a pejorative, like what you were just saying. I think that this is a medium and a genre in which has very specific offerings that no other uh, genre has the balls, so to speak, to, to borrow a phrase from Millicent. Uh, <laughs> To, to, to offer, because I genuinely think the way mainstream movies tackle sex has become really purian as of late. I mean, in the 70s, when porn was around, mainstream cinema was actually handling sex pretty well and in pretty daring and open and communicative ways. And I feel like ever since porn was chased out of the theaters, we've, we've gone backwards uh, in mainstream cinema as to how we are treating the subject. Because there's really only two modes. There's just the extremely hacky way that a movie that's not like marquee and mainstream that's not interested in sex does it, which is perfectly made up. Mm. And also we can't see anything and we're just, we only know one position, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's just a way to, I guess, make the movie rated R. Or there's the way, which I'm not saying knocking this, but it's also really only one flavor. But there's the way indie dramas do it, where it's like the exact opposite, <laughs> where it's like, super ugly humping and you know gritty and realistic uh right. because we can't have anything that's you know in between and it's or good point. it's just very didactic and binary and we we need a lot more fluidity to how sex is filmed and depicted mm -hmm. and porn obviously had a lot of different uh you know ideas about the concept and also how to frame it and uh, I think Sex World is fantastic. I think the characters, for the most part, are great. And even when one maybe isn't, uh, the actress still, like Annette Haven, still brings everything that they can to the role. And, you know, I want to put an end to people, because if we ever talk about another one, which I'm sure we will, mm -hmm. I didn't really want to give too much time to this, so I'll just make a brief statement that people think that, like, porn has bad acting. Well, some porn does, but in general... You try fucking on camera <laughs> and and still have an actual performance to give both mm. in and outside of the, the realm of having sex. Because honestly, I think there are classically trained actors today in Hollywood that cannot do this convincingly. I'm not saying all, mm -hmm. but like this is a type of performance, you know, the same way ballet is a type of performance that has its own rigid, uh, I think, strengths and weaknesses or whatever and there are people who are really good at it in my opinion and and a lot of them are in this movie for sure um, well I, I would agree and and as you said i'm just interrupt for a second but yeah. as you said i mean classically trained and, and that's exactly it is they've been trained in all these other kinds of acting but not in this and it's something that in some ways makes the people who do it who are very good at it more impressive because they've probably had to come by it on their own. They probably they didn't go to porn school, if you will. Yeah. So I, I, I just wanted to say that's a very astute point you made there. Thank you. So yeah, uh, I think this is basically a porn masterpiece and I absolutely love it. I'm so glad we were able to talk about it today. Definitely. So we are heading to the A-list. Cue it.
Ah, such a great theme as always. So today we are doing the A-list for Sex World. Of course, if you somehow missed it, it was a wonderful porno uh, concerning various couples and singles finding things out about themselves, both sexually and romantically. So uh, here in the A-list, what we do is we pair up uh, the movie we just talked about, usually a quote-unquote B-picture, so we pair it up with an A movie uh, to give a nice little pairing in case you uh, want to watch what we just talked about in context with something you may be more familiar with or more uh, willing to watch. So, Dan, let's hit you first. What is your pick for the A-list? Ah, well, thank you. Um, You know, it's funny because I struggled with this one uh, quite a bit. And then Heidi uh, came up with it and it was like a bolt of lightning. It was like, yes, that's exactly what we got to do. This is the one. So I'm going to go with a film directed by Glenn Ficarra and John Requa, Requia, Eh, Requa maybe uh, from 2011 called crazy, stupid love. Oh, yes. Yes. It's a very, very entertaining movie. Very well assembled. The script's by, um, I want to say it's Dan Fogelman or Alex Fogelman. I can't remember. I think it's Dan. Yeah. Dan. Yeah. It's a, it's a very cleverly assembled script that, that does not feel telegraphed at all. And so on the, on the women's side, you've got the incomparable Julianne Moore. Of course. Who kind of is playing an Annette Haven type in Boogie Nights. Oh, yes. Yes. Julianne Moore. Yes. Not at all autobiographical as far as like her actual story. Like she wasn't whatever, but she looks like Annette Haven. Let's just put that (laughs) much out there. That's great. I didn't connect that until now, but I'm sure I'll be making more of these connections as we do more of these episodes, actually. And that makes, no, it makes sense. So yeah, Julianne Moore, who's incomparable or incomparable, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And then there's Emma Stone as well in one of her films in which she's cast opposite Ryan Gosling. And they do have a very great chemistry. I can see why they kept getting cast together. I mean, there's a, there's like a scene in a convenience store where he like just out of the blue just sort of honks her nose. It's very goofy. He's like, Mark, oh, you should get that looked at. It's just very funny. It's just the kind of little tender, goofy thing you do. This film also features Leo Tipton, formerly Anna Lee Tipton. Hmm. I think this is her first role. She was a model who broke into acting and has done some very fine work, actually. I think uh, she was in Warm Bodies which uh, it was a supporting role. And she was in a film I just saw a couple of nights ago called All Nighter with J.K. Simmons and Emile Hirsch. And she's not in it very much, but she's a she's a very luminous presence. I think she's one of those models that really grasps how to perform in front of a camera that's recording moving pictures as well as just still images. You know, and it's it's a hard one. I mean, not everybody can do that. But she's quite good in that. And uh, actually, I thought All Nighter was really good. It got really bad reviews, but I thought it was surprisingly interesting and the acting was great. And and actually, it had a a very nice non-sentimental ending. But anyway, and then she's also in Mississippi Grind, which, Nick, I know you love and I have not seen. Yes. But I have been meaning to. And I actually got out of the library, so I'm going to watch it soon. (laughs) Uh, But. On the male side, there is plenty of man meat for the ladies in this movie, too. You got the aforementioned Ryan Gosling, you got Steve Carell, and the apparently ageless Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so it's not just about Julian Moore and Emma Stone and Leah Tipton. You know, there's anyway. Oh, and there's a priceless cameo by Josh Groban, which forced me to completely rethink him as a human being, which is always a good thing to have that happen to me. When He's a very game person. Very. I, mean, I haven't seen this actually. I've been meaning to because it's honestly everyone I've ever talked to who's seen it is like actually it's really good but I've seen Josh Groban in a bunch of random things like adult swim bits and he's completely on board for anything uh, to either kind of mess up his image or Mm -hmm. just play into that Uh, he's just a very funny guy he is. And in this, he plays such a uh, square dude. It's absolutely hysterical. And uh, I, I, he is, he is game as Ned Kelly for this stuff. I, I've seen him do stuff on the Late Late Show a few times where he's hilarious. He did this very impassioned version of Baby Shark, which was hilarious. I mean, he's just, I, again, once again, I realize, oh, I shouldn't be making all these stupid declarative statements until I've actually, you know, seen all the evidence. So, again, I am put in my place and I love it because that's what needs to happen. So just really fast. Some of the things that I thought 
reminded me of Sex World in the movie is there's several groups of people at once who are, you know, investigating sex and, you know, eventually love. So they're kind of cross cutting between the different stories. I mean, it's somewhat episodic in the same regard, although in the film, there's a way that it does get tied together a little bit, which is really nice. But like Ryan Gosling's character could be seen as sort of an analog for Roger in Sex World. Not that he's a bigot, he's he's but he's he's a pickup artist. He's seen it all. And he thinks he's done it all, and then he falls in love. And that's kind of a nice analog for Roger in some ways. And then Emma Stone's character, Hannah, goes home with Ryan Gosling's Jacob to fulfill a fantasy of what she figures sex will be like with, quote, the hot guy from the bar. And in turn, he shows her the move he does as his pull-out-all-the-stops panty dropper, uh, for lack of a better phrase. And it's all about fulfilling women's fantasies of the movie Dirty Dancing. You got it. It's great, great scene. And then uh, the married couple, the Julianne Moore and Steve Carell characters are a bit like Ralph and Millicent. Um, I mean, they're not quite as hung up, but they have very different ideas. They're of not what- yelling at each other about e- each other's genitals. Right. Well, there is that. Yeah. He doesn't call her mama. Thank God. But I mean, there are a couple that's been together a long time and they're starting to realize they had very different ideas of what uh, their sex lives would be. And it's part of what causes their marriage to, to falter. Julianne Moore, who's Emily, she has an affair that, you know, precipitates uh, their separation. But she's actually more conservative in that regard. While Steve Carell's character, uh, Cal, when he has this freedom, he goes for it all. But of course, in the end, he just really kind of wants her back. Uh, the, I think at one point he says that uh, my wife, she was the perfect combination of hot and cute, which I totally get that. I thought that was such a nice little line. Again, it's great script. And uh, so Crazy Stupid Love, highly recommend. I've seen it several times and um, I'd watch it again any old time. It's very enjoyable. That is one of the few true uh, crowd pleasers, I think, that have come out in the last like 10 years where everyone I know who's seen it recommends it. Yeah. And it makes me want to watch it because I still haven't watched it yet because when it came out, I just didn't really think much of it like when it was in the theater. But I haven't caught up with it yet. But this may push it over the edge for me to, to, to go seek it out because it sounds like a great time. Excellent. Um, my choice for the A-list to pair with Sex World is kind of the inverse of Sex World in one particular sense where it's not about a bunch of couples. It's about one. Mm. But it does a similarly deft trick in combining a simple sci-fi concept uh, while it deconstructs a couple on the rocks. And that is The One I Love from 2014. Oh, uh, directed nice. by Charlie McDowell, yes. Uh, I film- couldn't remember... Um, sorry to interrupt. I just I yeah. couldn't remember if you had seen that or not. And I felt like it, I saw it around the same time as I saw Coherence, which I know you love. And oh, yeah. it reminded me very much of that very chamber piece sci-fi film where it depends entirely on the acting to really make it work and, and the writing, of course. So Yeah, absolutely. And it stars Mark Duplass and Elizabeth Moss as a couple who essentially have hit a very stale place in their marriage. And it's not inherently uh, due to a sexual reason, though I'm that's certainly on the rocks as well because everything is for them. But essentially they do this one last ditch attempt to see if there's something worth saving by going to this vacation house. And it's billed as a getaway for couples who need something, you know, like that. But it's very vague in how it will attempt to help them course correct. And when they arrive, there's not a lot of guidance given. I mean, I think they have a little lip service to like, you know, like this activity that you can try, whatever. Yeah. But it seems very hands off at first until they notice that there is something amiss about the guest house that is on the premises. And when a party is in there, they are treated to something that is probably way more effective than any (laughs) therapy could ever uh, be uh, offered to any normal human being. And I don't want to give it away because honestly, the trailers do a good job of hiding it as well. But the detail of what that guest house has to offer uh, the central couple is something that I think anybody who's ever been in a relationship, or even if they haven't, would love to explore in their mind with, you know, even couples that are in good standing. I think you can't watch it passively mm-hmm. <laughs> where when you, when you see that concept, you'll, you'll start to wonder about your own where you'll say, huh, would that 
have the same effect on us if that were to happen, you know? And I think every couple would love to think that it wouldn't, but I think there's something very powerful. I'm not saying like no couple is good or anything like that, but I think there's something very powerful about what the one I love suggests about our expectations versus reality and and the connections we make with the people that we've been with for such a long time. Mm. And uh, for that reason, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with the one I love. Nice. It's a great choice. And uh, honestly, It's one of those where, I mean, to quote another Soderbergh movie, The Limey, it's like, the thing I thought I wanted wasn't what I wanted. I mean, that's a terrible Cockney accent, but you get the idea. It's like, (laughs) the thing I thought wasn't the thing I thought, I. you know what I mean? But, but you know, in a way, much like Sex World, this place is sort of providing a service that allows people to perhaps understand themselves better in their spouse you know but it's 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 very well done and, and it's it's sci-fi without really any special effects to speak of it's it's in i think it's entirely just down to the writing the acting and the great ideas in it absolutely so i think it's a great choice to pair with sex world mm-hmm. and uh, as i think is crazy Stupid Love. That's exactly what I kind of dreamed of this segment to be, which is like to take those movies that we all know, even if we haven't seen them, and it's like, yeah, you know what? This thing in this circle is actually touching on something that you do see every day, like in something like a Ryan Gosling, Emma Stone romantic comedy. You know? Right. Uh, well, Dan, I think this has been a blast as always. Mm-hmm. I think we both very much enjoyed Sex World, obviously, and I think it won't be the last entry in the Golden Age Urotica mm-hmm. uh, that we'll do on Project Exploitation. But coming up next time, maybe we will take a little journey to the east <laughs> okay i didn't quite get it but you, you get the idea uh, i think they'll get the idea once they actually see the episode and yes. uh, then they can i don't know that they'll get it from just that though. right they'll be like oh now now i see what you were yeah you were going for and, That's and, right. and not yeah. really not not getting there but i know what you're going for bro i see it now yeah yeah <laughs> definitely so <laughs> If you want an answer to Dan's Shazam riddle, then tune in next time <laughs> nice. to the next episode <laughs> of Project Exploitation. My name is Nick Cheney, and of course, with me was Dan Jeremy Brooks. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, yeah, keep it real. And it just needs an end, Max. I. I don't have an end.